After nearly three years of planning and several failed attempts due to the pandemic, in 2023 I was finally able to travel to South America to collaborate with Professor Thomas Kitzberger and a team of other scientists. Despite the distances separating our countries and the differences in the types of forests we normally study, in many ways the challenges facing these ecosystems under a warming climate are the same. For years now, the narrative of climate change has focused on the changes that we can expect to see happening in the future if we fail to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But yesterday's warnings are rapidly becoming today's reality, and there is now compelling evidence that these changes have already started. Ecosystems and the species within them are increasingly confronted with a climate that's outside their normal range of conditions to which they are adapted. In the context of forest ecosystems, this has meant that widespread tree mortality and losses in forest productivity linked to these extreme drought events have now been documented on every forested continent on Earth. The overarching aim of this trip was to build international collaborations and bring together expertise to work towards common scientific objectives. We want to understand how resistant and resilient forests are to drought, why some species or even individual trees are more resilient than others, and under what conditions drought overcomes this resilience to result in tree mortality. As these extreme events become more frequent and severe, we are entering a period of huge uncertainty. Understanding why some tree species or forests are more resilient than others, and the drought conditions that result in tree mortality is critical if we are to develop management and conservation strategies that allow us to adapt to the challenges of a changing climate. Sometimes we have to look backwards to go forwards, and exploring the science of extreme events is a great example of this. Understanding how forests and the tree species within them have responded to drought and other extreme events in the past can help us understand how resilient they are and how they might respond in the future. One of the most important scientific techniques we use for this is dendrochronology, which involves the collection of tree cores from both living and dead trees. In many parts of the world, tree growth is tightly linked with how favourable the climate in a given year was. This means that we can compare the width of annual growth rings during a drought year with growth under average climate conditions to understand how tree growth behaves under stress and how resistant or resilient they were. We can also use these tree rings to reconstruct climate back in time, far beyond the period where we had climate stations and our instrumental record began, sometimes for thousands of years. To reconstruct climate as far back in time as possible, you want to collect samples from as old of trees as possible. But this isn't as simple as it sounds, as the largest trees are not necessarily the oldest trees. Thomas and I were lucky enough to spend a day collecting tree core samples from beautiful old Chilean cedars in the Argentinian side of northern Patagonia with Dr. Ricardo Velalba and his amazing team. These samples were being collected for a project that's trying to reconstruct global climate for the last 1,000 years, and the team had unexpectedly spotted this previously unknown site we were about to visit during the previous day's fieldwork. As many trees were quite old, the centre was often rotten, and so collecting samples from higher up in the tree often gives us a better chance of avoiding what's referred to as rot pockets. Rotten parts of the tree are unusable for our research, but remarkably can sometimes hold and then release water when accidentally tapped by a tree corer. Attempting to avoid these rock pockets had the unexpected benefit of combining my love of rock climbing with remote fieldwork, as we tried to access the best part of the trees which were often growing in hard to reach places, nestled amongst rocky outcrops. As well as tree cores, we collected cross-sectional discs from long dead trees that littered the landscape. These dead trees have been preserved at the western edge of the Patagonian steppe, where conditions are very dry, before the Andes rises up dramatically, causing the climate to shift towards much wetter and cooler conditions. With the samples safely collected, it was time for a beer before Ricardo and his team headed back north towards Mendoza, where many hours of lab work would now be needed to process the samples and extract the information contained within them. About a week later, I joined Dr. Alejandro Venegas Gonzalez and his colleague Pablo Paredes Berrios as part of a team exploring recently documented cases of forest mortality in the Mediterranean type ecosystems of Chile, north of Patagonia. As the name suggests, this area is characterised by a Mediterranean type climate and is often hot and dry. The forests here are well adapted to deal with these conditions, but as our climate changes, these already hot and dry conditions are becoming even hotter and more extreme. It's thought that this region has been in a prolonged period of unusually dry conditions for approximately the last 10 years. 
Superimposed on top of these consistently above average temperatures and below average precipitation, this region was hit by an extreme drought in 2018 and it's thought that this event triggered widespread forest mortality across a large area and across different forest types. To explore the extent of this tree mortality, we visited two sites in La Campana National Park a couple of hours north of Santiago. Despite these two sites being on either side of the same mountain, they were remarkably different. The first site was extremely arid and one of the last forests of the Chilean palm which is in danger of extinction. Here even slight differences in the direction the slope faces visibly alters the type of vegetation growing there, as if somebody had drawn a line along every little ridge. Despite the relatively low tree density here, the effects of drought were obvious as the landscape was littered with recently dead trees. We spent the afternoon exploring these slopes and discussing how best to capture these types of mortality events and estimate the resilience of surviving individuals. The next day we visited the western side of the national park, where green slopes of the other side of the same mountain were a stark contrast to the previous day. Here the western facing slopes of the mountain benefit from the cooler and moister ocean air. In turn these climatic differences result in a whole range of different tree species, with the palms of yesterday giving way to the characteristic southern beech forests on the upper slopes. Despite these differences in climate and vegetation, as we explored these upper slopes, the evidence of tree mortality was also clear here, with the leafless tops of dead trees littering the forest canopy. This was the first time I'd seen tree mortality of a single species on this scale, and it certainly brought the reality of the science we were doing into sharp focus. We spent the remainder of the day collecting samples from surviving trees, which Alejandro and his team will now use to understand why these trees survived and how resilient they might be to future droughts. Four hours south of La Campana National Park, but still within the Mediterranean-type ecosystem of central Chile, we visited a second study site, the private nature reserve of San Juan de Piche. Alejandro and Pablo already have some experiments running within this forest reserve, and so the first part of the day was spent collecting the next set of samples for their project. Pablo was using a piece of equipment called a dendrometer, which is fixed to the tree and gives an accurate measure of tree radial growth over time, and what was essentially a mini tree corer. This mini corer is hammered into the tree to extract only the first few centimetres of depth from the bark. Pablo will be using these tiny cores to understand how the development of tree xylem, through which water is transported up the tree, are affected by drought at the cellular level. Later that day, and back up another hill, we again began collecting tree cores from a range of trees, but this time we were also recording a visual assessment of the amount of canopy dieback. The fact that trees appear to be able to sacrifice part of their crown is likely an example of an adaptive trait that helps them to survive drought conditions, as it dramatically reduces the amount of area they need to maintain when resources like water are limited. Interestingly, some trees that appeared to be mostly dead were showing clear signs of new growth re-sprouting from the base an adaptation that likely evolved in some species to deal with the catastrophic effects of fire. While this observation is encouraging as it suggests that some species may be able to recover even after a catastrophic drought, if the frequency of these extreme events increases then even these species may not have enough time to recover before the next event. This re-sprouting behaviour after a catastrophic event also left me wondering about how difficult it is to know when a tree is truly dead and where a more nuanced perspective of tree death than purely dead or alive might be useful. For our final day in Chile, we headed east towards the Andes, where the climate was cooler, the trees grew taller, and the southern beech forests took on a more temperate feel. As we explored the upper tree line of these forests, it was clear that they had been far less affected by drought-induced mortality than we had witnessed elsewhere. But if our climate continues to warm, it won't be long before these forests also suffer the same fate, and we really don't know quite how close we are to that becoming a reality. Back in Argentinian Patagonia, there was one more study site to visit, this time with PhD researcher Romina González Musso. Bright and early, we headed out across the massive Noalhuapi Lake on a small boat to reach one of Romina's new study sites. Once we'd landed on the shore, located and measured out the sample plot in the forest, we set up a curious set of styrofoam balls before retreating beyond the edge of the plot so that Romina could fire millions of lasers into the forest. This technique is called terrestrial laser scanning and will allow Romina to reconstruct a high resolution, three dimensional image of the forest plot by essentially measuring how long it takes the laser to bounce back. This will allow her to accurately estimate above ground forest biomass and ground truth satellite data. 
The peculiar white balls act as a kind of spatial anchor and stay in place between repeated scans so that all of the data generated by the lasers can be triangulated. Despite the sobering nature of the research we were doing in Argentina and Chile, it's impossible not to appreciate the staggering beauty of the landscapes we were in. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the International Union of Forest Research Organisations who provided the funding for this trip, and to all of the amazing scientists that hosted me during my time in Argentinian Patagonia and central Chile. All our work is still ongoing, so keep an eye out for future updates on our research. <laughs>